Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome on this fine Sunday morning. A uh, special welcome to our guests and visitors that, with, that are with us this day. It is a joy and a privilege to have you here with us as we gather to celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I invite you to stand as you are able and turn to page 94 the front part of the written book. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. We also acknowledge the today and Hopi peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Flagstaff area in which we meet, and we pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all indigenous peoples of Arizona and the United States. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another, beginning with a moment of silence. Gracious God, have the mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown. Things that you have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in the newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. Let us sing our opening hymn, hymn number 645, Praise His Name to Sure Foundation.
The second reading is from Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone amongst you, 
not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand to for the gospel acclamation. Glory to you, Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but by my Father in heaven. For flesh and and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Sisters, brothers, siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is. I don't know how many of you know this, but the city of, well, I said Caesarea Philippi, but more technically, Caesarea Philippi, is located about 20, 25 miles north, northeast of the Sea of Galilee. At the time, it was the capital of the region of Iturea, and was ruled by King Herod's brother, Philip. More importantly, Caesarea Philippi was an official Roman colony and therefore had a temple dedicated to the worship of the Holy Roman Emperor, or not Holy Roman Emperor, the Roman Emperor, as the Son of God. As you can see, it was no accident that Jesus asked his disciples these two questions where he did. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And who do you say that I am? Peter's confession of Jesus being the Messiah, the Son of the living God, you know, as opposed to the, the Son of some non-living fake God of Rome, like Jupiter or Mercury. Peter's response is well known, as is Jesus' response to Simon, son of Jonah. I tell you, you are Petros, and on this Petra I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
How many of you have ever seen a cartoon that has, like, uh, St. Peter standing at the pearly gates, uh, allowing some people in and excluding others? In case you haven't, here's a couple. First one is Moses. Not Moses. St. Peter there, it says, pointing to the side, no atheist, and the atheist says, I don't believe it. <laughs> the other one is, shows uh, St. Peter saying, I can't believe I locked my keys inside again. He's got a hanger trying to poke his way in. <laughs> as cute as these may be, and as as grained as this idea may be, even among non-believers, I think it's totally wrong for a couple of reasons at least. The first is the idea that, that Peter has the, the keys to the kingdom and the power to bind and to loose does not mean that Peter gets to decide who gets in and who's out. As a human being, St. Peter has no authority over who enters the kingdom of heaven. Only God has that authority and ability, because only God knows what's in human hearts. Rather, when Jesus gives Peter the keys to bind and loose, he's using a Jewish cultural image of a rabbi's authority. In other words, Jesus designated to Peter the responsibility, and I guess the privilege, of being the head interpreter of the law after Jesus' death and resurrection. Peter is the lead minister for the faith community. And we see this at work when, for example, in, say, Acts chapter 15, when Peter makes the final authoritative, definitive decision that Gentiles like us don't have to be circumcised and don't have to keep the laws of Moses in order to be disciples, let alone get into heaven. At the exact same time, Jesus later gives all the disciples the privilege and the responsibility of being ministers in the church, and dare I say, out in public as well. I know that's a scary thought. <laughs> but as the baptized, we are all responsible for carrying on this God-given ministry of Jesus, of, of reaching out to embrace and be with humanity for the sake of love and communion, to proclaim resurrection in the face of sin, death, and evil, in the face of human degradation and nothingness. Well, and this leads me to my second point. The second reason that the image of Peter as the gatekeeper is misguided is that it gives the impression that the church is a human-made institution, especially in the secular age that we live in, where people believe that God and the transcendent don't even exist. In these two car cartoons, the first one said, uh, St. Peter says to the individual, you've been randomly selected for additional screening. <laughs> and the second one says, sorry, your username and password don't matter. <laughs> Sounds like a human institution, doesn't it? <laughs> the church, however, is not a human-made institution, but a God-given gift. Human-made institutions, banks, hospitals, police and fire departments, the court system, nonprofits, utilities, and the like, exist because we as a society, we humans, have invested some of our individual power into them in order to collectively accomplish things that we would not be able to accomplish otherwise by ourselves, or at least maybe do those things more efficiently and productively. Human institutions have the power to heal, support, reconcile, build, protect, connect, and a, and a whole host of other verbs that create peace and good order in society. All good things. Human institutions can accomplish good in the world, even save people from worldly problems. But there are problems that exceed our power as humans. We have limitations, things that technology and greater learning cannot overcome, namely sin, death, and evil that lead to dehumanization and nothingness. Oh, someday we may figure out a technological means to genetically engineer ourselves so that our bodies don't age and die, and to control weather and the earth so as to minimize or even eliminate some natural disasters. But that won't stop accidents. And it certainly doesn't help those who died before that. We can also grow in maturity, 
so that our relationships function at a, a higher ethical and moral levels. But there will still be sin, death, and evil. In other words, there will always be problems and situations for which our human power will be insufficient. Our human institutions can do good, but they cannot solve all problems because our flesh is weak. This weakness requires help from outside of ourselves. It requires revelation. Jesus said to the disciples, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Or as Luther wrote in his small catechism on the third article of the Apostles' Creed, I believe that my own reason and strength, excuse me, I believe that by my own reason or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and preserved me in true faith, just as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and preserves it in union with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and abundantly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers, and on the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and will grant eternal life to me and to all who believe in Christ. This is most certainly true. The church is a gift from God. Now, have we found ways to mess it up and, and obscure their, its divine origins? You betcha. <laughs> and yet the church persists because God graciously continues to forgive and renew it, making it a new creation daily. The church is the community of forgiven believers gathered by God to proclaim and live out the gospel through ministry. Yes, the church has human traditions, candles, liturgy, hymnody, and music, among others. We use these to help express what is in our hearts and in our minds in order to connect, help us connect with God, others, and the world around us for the sake of ministry. They also help us prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's gifts of word and sacrament, which are a means of God's saving grace, of God's life-giving ministry among us. In contrast, our human traditions are not salvific. Praying the Lord's Prayer before communion will not save you. It won't get you past St. Peter. <laughs> Technically, being baptized and taking communion will not save you either. God saves by grace through faith in Jesus and his ministry of the cross. This gospel, this good news of God, which we hear through God's word and the sacraments, is what creates faith, love, and trust in us, thereby making God's salvific promises effective in our lives. Faith is not a human work. Faith is a revelation from God. Faith transforms us in ways that human power, human reason, strength, and institutions cannot, because faith comes from the Holy Spirit and not weak human flesh. The Holy Spirit reveals and preaches this gospel to us. By this gospel, the Spirit illumines and kindles hearts and minds so that they grasp and accept it, so that we might cling to it and persevere in it, so that when we are asked to give an accounting of the hope that lies within us, we, like Peter before us, can say, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Apostles Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. God of Sarah and Abram, inspire your church to pursue righteousness in its ministry. Equip us to share your compassion that unites us as one family of faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Remind us that from the beginning of creation, you knit together a world meant for harmony. Protect and restore the wasted places to joy and gladness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Stir the leaders of nations and towns, militaries and courts to respond to your teachings. Let your call for justice reach all people and bring deliverance where there is oppression. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Show your steadfast love and faithfulness to those in despair. Increase their strength. Care for all who feel low. Keep safe any of them in the midst of trouble. And protect vulnerable people, vulnerable people from harm. Especially Rich, Nick, Dolly, Minnie, Molina, Walker, Mariah, Joe and family, Bridget, Jess, Jeff, William, Donna, Cheryl, Kyle, Pamela, Missy, John, Julie, Caden, Jeannie, Jane, Paula, Aurora, Brenda, David, and Sheila, Alexandra, Elizabeth, and Jacob. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Encourage those who offer their gifts and talents in service to your church. Energize this congregation's rostered and lay leaders, musicians, teachers, readers, and administrators, so they may be transformed in sharing your grace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the ELCA Disaster Relief, our monthly basket recipient. May those they serve be touched by your grace through our offerings. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For what else do the people of God pray? For the children of the world. For the people and the freedom fighters of Ukraine. Those who suffer from violence. The people of Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all the saints, death is overcome in Christ's resurrection. We rejoice with the faithful departed. Sustain us in the hope until we come at last to our heavenly home. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's greet one another in that same peace.
by your graciousness in us, that the world may be fed with your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our joy and our privilege, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to relive me. Then after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had blessed it and given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to relive me. Having been made one in the Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Thanks be to God. God.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace into everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshments we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Let us sing our sending him, hymn number 820 in the right hand of Savior, precious Savior. <laughs> Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God, and we will.